A cordial welcome to this Social Innovators Award celebration. This year, in a virtual form, to which we all have become accustomed to in the last six months. Usually, we meet in person during the UN General Assembly at the Sustainable Development Impact Summit of the World Economic Forum, where social innovators play an important role. Last year, we began the summit at the opening plenary consisting entirely of social innovators, demonstrating the key role they have to play in the sustainable development agenda. This year, the SDI summit is more important than ever, and I invite you to participate in the program, which is high-level, impact-oriented, and where your contribution to the different issues is highly valued. The COVID-19 pandemic is exposing deep inequalities, disproportionately affecting vulnerable and excluded communities. It has also demonstrated to all of us how important and challenging it is to be a social innovator. You are needed more than ever, but at the same time have to fight for continued existence because of lockdown and lack of resources. For this reason, we have created the COVID Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs and Innovators with over 60 other organizations, philanthropic foundations, businesses, international organizations, impact investors and intermediaries to coordinate the sector's efforts to overcome the significant impacts of COVID-19. I'm very touched by the stories I heard from many of you, which showed what individuals can achieve in a situation that has brought so much pain anxiety and suffering to millions. I can only imagine what courage and perseverance it takes to continue your mission in such difficult and sometimes tragic conditions. I want to express to you my deep admiration, my great thanks, and I do so on behalf of all of us in the Schwab Foundation, as well as on behalf of the 800 colleagues at the World Economic Forum. You are true role models when working with the mission of the Forum in mind, committed to improving the state of the world. It is even more important today than the last 20 years to come together and celebrate social innovators. Social innovation must penetrate society and should become incorporated into all aspects of life. As you know, we have extended our community by integrating, in addition to the traditional social entrepreneurs, three more categories. Corporate social entrepreneurs, leaders inside a company that address societal and environmental challenges. Public social entrepreneurs, government leaders or leaders in international organizations. And social innovation thought leaders, recognized, respected experts and academics. And this year, we went through a particularly intensive selection process where we felt we should spotlight the special efforts being made in fighting the pandemic and its consequences. What we need when we hopefully, and thanks to a fair distribution of treatment and testing, move out of the pandemic is a common effort to create a more resilient, more inclusive and more sustainable world. We need a great reset. I want to introduce the president of the World Economic Forum, Berge Brende, who in his former position as the foreign minister of Norway, acted himself as a social entrepreneur in the political field, very importantly, moderating the peace process in Colombia. Thank you so much, Hilda. It's really my great pleasure to congratulate this year's Schwab Foundation Social Innovators of the Year. You have done such an impressive job and work, and um, you join also such an impressive community. The Schwab Foundation's social innovators operate in over 190 countries, impacting the lives of 622 million people. That's impressive. By uh, spotlighting local solutions and local capacity, and by working with partners across the forum's networks, this community is truly improving the state of the world. Today, as we respond to COVID-19 crisis and the pandemic, and stakeholders look to shape a recovery, the work you do and the way you do it with creativity, 
with purpose and in partnership is ever more critical. Thank you. This summer, the forum launched a great reset. I hope you heard about it. This initiative is to address the urgent challenges we face in a way that delivers a more inclusive, sustainable, job-creating, and resilient future. From restoring the health of our people and our planet to renewing prosperity, an innovative approach is definitely needed. We can't continue, for example, to act like we have a planet B, because there is no planet B. This approach, uh, the Great Reset, strengthens partnerships within and between societies. This is why the Great Reset is convening leaders from across business, government, and civil society for purpose-driven, action-oriented collaboration. We know that progress happens when we bring together stakeholders who have the drive and the influence to make positive change happen. Which is why we need passionate and values-driven champions such as yourselves part of this work. Your work building a more just and equitable world is crucial to shaping a stronger future. And you can act as a lighthouse community, inspiring others to take meaningful action. I think your work has been very consequential, and um, the time uh, is now crucial to address the big challenges we're facing. And I'm heartened to see such a committed and innovative group of leaders as you represent. On behalf of the World Economic Forum, it is my pleasure to really congratulate you on this award. I wish you continued success and look forward to having you part of the World Economic Forum's community and continue to make such huge consequential impact in improving the state of our planet. I want to express my deep thanks to the Motsepe Foundation for their great partnership since many years, and I ask Dr. Precious Motsepe to address us. Dear Precious, as a medical doctor and in many functions, also as Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, you have shown your social engagement in many ways and how a privileged position with the heart in the right place can be used to do a lot of good. Your foresight in creating a platform to showcase and celebrate social entrepreneurship is at a point when all countries and global communities are battling to make sense of the many social and economic challenges that poorer communities have had to live with all these years. This is now a reality for even developed and wealthy nations. As the Motsipa Foundation, we feel hopeful as we witness this new normal, and we believe that the social entrepreneurs will help society to redefine our practices in this new era. We applaud you for your work in creating the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. By its very nature, social entrepreneurship, with its emphasis on social innovation and system thinking, is a winning business model for, ma for the majority of poor countries where health systems, education, and social security have been found wanting. Our social entrepreneurs use innovative business models and new technology to give hope to the millions of people living on the margins. We're seeing students whose career investments are at risk because they have no electricity or laptops at home. There are mothers who may lose their lives in childbirth because of the inadequate access to health systems, which are still reeling from the pandemic. And young people whose informal businesses have had to be shut down, leaving them and many of their employees and their families unable to sustain themselves. In the nonprofit sector, social innovators provide us with solutions that return exponential benefits, which is vital if we're going to attain the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. 
There is a 2.5 trillion funding shortage every year when it comes to investments towards these goals. The eradication of poverty and ensuring equal access to opportunity is everyone's business. But without adequate resources, we must advocate for improving our current investments, guiding our capital towards the innovators who are scaling transformations through changes to our systems, our processes, and our lifestyles. It begins with an idea, but to the innovators here today who took those ideas and made them into something meaningful, I virtually applaud you. In times of crisis, we rely on innovative thinkers like yourselves to guide our next steps. We look to your ideas and your inventions and we find hope. What is particularly unique about social entrepreneurship is that it is able to break down sectors, shining a light on collaborative paths that we can walk together. We all know the African proverb, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. We are excited to walk this journey with you and we reimagine our future together. We have now the immense pleasure to honor the awardees 2020. And I ask Francois Bonici, head of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, to introduce them. Thank you, Mrs. Schwab. Social innovators are disruptors in the service of others, especially in situations where the market or traditional actors have failed. From harnessing the power of fourth industrial revolution technologies to educate teens in Africa, to protecting some of the world's most vulnerable groups in Asia and pioneering sustainable consumption in Europe and ultimately building ecosystems to support social innovation globally. The social innovators of the year are using their ingenuity, creativity and determination to solve and wrestle with the world's most pressing problems. Social innovators are crucial in the response and the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and are an integral part of the Great Reset. I'm delighted to congratulate and welcome three of the Schwab Foundation Social Innovation Awardees of 2020 to discuss with me the challenges and the opportunities of social innovation in the time of COVID. Guilherme Brammer Jr., Bumera, Brazil. Jesus Herrera and Mauricio Lim Miller, Family Independence Initiative, USA. Azim Sabahat, Global Healthcare Systems, India. Adriana Barbosa, Preta Hub, Brazil. Ashif Shaikh, Jan Sahas, India. And now, in the Corporate Social Entrepreneur category, Prashant Mehra, Social Inclusion, Mindtree, India. Corinne Bazina, Danone Communities, Danone, France. Nicola Galombic, Yellowwoods Holding, South Africa. Hadi Wibowo, Sharia TBK, BTPN Bank, Indonesia. And now in the Social Innovation Thought Leader category, Jeff Shen Dongshu, Leping Social Entrepreneur Foundation, People's Republic of China. Tse Kakui, KK, Education for Good, Hong Kong. Ndidi Nuneli, Sahel Consulting, Agriculture and Nutrition, Nigeria. Catherine Clark, the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, Duke University, USA. And now in the Public Social Entrepreneur category, Ada Colau Ibayano, Mayor of Barcelona, Spain. Cynthia McCaffrey, UNICEF representative to the People's Republic of China. Congratulations to all of you and welcome to our community. And now we come to another exciting part of our meeting where we discuss the challenges to drive social innovation forward in this age of COVID-19 crisis and beyond. I'm delighted to now introduce our panel. From the Social Entrepreneur of the Year category, Lindiwe Matlali, Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Africa Teen Geeks in South Africa. In the Corporate Social Entrepreneur category, Karine Bazina, General Manager of Danone Communities from Danone in France. From the Social Innovation Thought Leader category, Jeff Sheng Dongshu from the Leaping Social Entrepreneur Foundation in the People's Republic of China. Welcome to all of you. I'm really honored and delighted and inspired to have you here. Lindiwe, I'm gonna start with you. 
As a compatriot, uh, we are greatly inspired by your work and that of Africa Teen Geeks. Please tell us a little bit about your work and why the work you've done is so important during the time of the COVID pandemic and how you and your team have responded. Thank you so much um, for, for your honor. First of all, I would like to um, thank you and the World Economic uh, Forum and Shop Foundation for, um, for the recognition. It means a lot. And also to take this time and, and congratulate all, um, all the winners as well. Um, Africa Teen Geeks started as just a non-profit organization that was focusing on, on teaching African kids how to code um, with the vision of inspiring the next generation of tech innovators and entrepreneurs. But our role has then evolved um, specifically on now we, we don't just focus on coding and robotics only, we also focus on STEM. Um, I'm sure you are aware with the, the report that came that put South Africa as one of the, the least performing um, when it comes to math and science. So we, um, we cannot really start focusing on, um, as you are aware with the, the, our, our president putting together the, um, the commission on the fourth industrial revolution. Um, that we want South Africa to be a leader in Africa, really, in, in innovation, specifically in the tech sector. We can't do that if our kids are not uh, performing well in STEM. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of the programs that are currently available, um, you know, that are sponsored, they focus when the kids are from grade 10 to 12, basically their last three years of education. And and we, I feel personally, but also as, a, as an organization, as an organization that is too late. We have to start as early as possible when the kids actually start school and start getting them to be comfortable, but also to love math, to love science, to be, to, to be passionate about it. So that by the time they get to grade 10, where they need to choose a subject, then math and or, or STEM are not um, those scary subjects that you need to be a genius to do, because I, I don't believe that. I think um, it's about muscle memory. The, the longer you teach a child, the more comfortable they are with, with, with any subject, the better they become. So if we start with them as early as possible, early intervention is more is actually important rather than coming and trying to fix the problems that we find when it's already too late for our kids. And um, our role during um, the, the COVID-19, um, I think that's one of the great thing about being a nonprofit, but also being able to respond quickly. Um, when our president announced um, the lockdown, it was on a Thursday, um, and on Monday, we launched our online school to, um, and we were able to get children. I mean, the, the first week we had about 30,000 kids that signed up from grade R, so as young as six years old up until um, grade 12. And by the end of, of lockdown, we, we were already reaching around 500,000 children. Um, so that has really been exciting for us, but also being able to really develop a fully fledged school with a staff of 110 teachers and running about 200 sessions every day. So that was exciting and chaotic, but uh, really great to see um, how our teachers also were, were able to respond because um, also all of them had never taught online. So we had to literally give them a two hour training session and, and then be able, they had to really jump in there. And it's been so great to see how most of them were able to just go there. We had a teacher, for example, who was, um, who didn't have a computer. He was teaching from a, his cell phone, but he also didn't have an, an internet and his house was not so great. So he went and was teaching his class actually outside in a tree from his house. And that was for us just shows the commitment and the passion that um, you know our teachers and also I would say our people have for education if they're given an opportunity to, to serve. Lindiwa, you're such an outstanding example of what so many social innovators have done in this period. Um, but it's because of the work that you've been doing for so many years that put you in a position to be able to adapt and respond and support, in your case, so many government teachers and government schools in being able to kind of roll out these programs in a way that sometimes the public sector were not ready to do um, because of uh, what they had been facing and the severe lockdown that South Africa faced. So, uh, I mean, great credit to you and, and your team for being able to do that in such a short period of time, but also it's such an example uh, of why social innovators can be supporting government programs 
but also running uh, and developing their business with technology. Karina, I want to come to you now. Um, you and the known communities and the known have been supporting the work of social entrepreneurs for many years now. Uh, please tell us a little bit about why a company like Danone uh, has supported and invested in social entrepreneurs. Let me tell you a little bit about what is Danone Communities first. So it's a corporate investment fund that is dedicated to social businesses. That means that uh, we, my job, in fact, is to identify uh, innovative social entrepreneurs that have decided to dedicate their life in order to solve a social issue. And the role with Danone Communities is to bring them the support they need, either capital, can be expertise, can be networking, so that they can create sustainable uh, social impact at scale. So why a company, a corporate like Danone, would invest in that? The fund has been created to the initiative of Professor Mohamed Yunus and Danone. Uh, in fact, uh, in Danone, uh, since the 70s, uh, we have what we call the dual project. Uh, the conviction that social and economic goes together. Um, you cannot uh, uh, grow a company in a desert, was saying uh, Antoine Ribou, uh, the previous CEO of, uh, of Danone. So there is this conviction from uh, the very beginning that you need to take into account all your stakeholders if you want to create sustainable value. Um, having said that, uh, even if it was a conviction uh, into uh, the organization, we felt uh, at some point that we needed something, a vehicle that was even more at the forefront in order to push Danone to accelerate uh, toward its transformational journey. And that's why Danone Communities was created uh, in order uh, for Danone uh, to be able to learn by doing, uh, to uh, explore uh, different ways to do business, um, and also to inspire people uh, within Danone um, as a kind of north guiding star um, so that um, it helps uh, people uh, within the company to see and to feel and also to experiment that it's possible uh, to do business in a different way. And thanks, Corinne. You've also described what it takes and what it means to be a, a corporate social entrepreneur, what we started to recognize last year through this new award category and why you know, we believe there are these similarities between social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs because of the mission, because of the way you work, because of the commitment and passion, because of uh, the persistence, but you have different tools at your disposal. In the last year, we've seen stakeholder capitalism and the stakeholder approach get a lot of attention. Clearly, it's been the motto and the philosophy of the World Economic Forum for its 50-year history. Uh, and earlier this year, Danone became uh, the first listed company in France to adopt the Entreprise à Mission, uh, the mission-based enterprise, uh, which came into French law in 2019. So tell us what it means to be as Danone communities, the driving internal force of some of this change. You've explained you have you know, a company that has got its values driven in purpose, and yet you have a role inside the company as well. So tell us a little bit around what is the role of corporate entrepreneurs in driving and realizing these kinds of missions? Our role is to challenge uh, the statu quo within the enterprise. In fact, I think what we play as a role is exactly the role that social entrepreneurs are playing with the world, I would say. Um, so we challenge the statu quo and we act as accelerators and as disruptors, as inspirators. So that's mainly what we do within the company. And you were explaining to me in a call we had last week as well that you often test out some of the business models uh, of what might inspire, but also demstrate what's possible within a company. Yes, exactly. Can you give I us an example? 
Um, well, I think, for instance, uh, B Corp can be an example. Uh, as you may know, Danone has an objective of being uh, B Corp uh, certified 100% by 2025. And uh, this was even uh, brought forward. Initially, we were thinking of adding it by 2030. And uh, B Corp is a certification uh, that helps you to measure the value that you create for all your stakeholders. I think if we had said something like that in 2007, for instance, to people within Danone, when Danone Communities was created, that at some point within Danone, we will measure uh, the value that we create for all our stakeholders, nobody would have believed us with, within the company. Uh, because we did it uh, with some social businesses, uh, starting, for instance, by uh, Gramin Danone, which was the pioneer one, where we said, uh, we will measure in this business not only the financial value, but also the value we create for all the stakeholders within the value chain, which was an example uh, to show that it's possible to do that in business, not only in a social business, but also in a classical business. So this could be one of the examples, for instance. Thanks, Corinne. And that's been a, a long legacy. And now we see so many companies needing to and wanting to report on their environmental, social and governance metrics. And you've been a trailblazer in, in that. So congratulations again. I, I want to now turn to, to Jeff and thank you for joining us so late uh, in, in China. We're delighted to have you here. You have been a pivotal node really a, a, a father figure of building the field of social innovation and social entrepreneurship in the People's Republic of China, recognized by so many people around the world. We're really honored to have you here. Tell us a little bit about the Leaping Social Entrepreneur Foundation uh, and your work over the years and how social innovation and, social and the practice of social entrepreneurship is different in the context uh, of China. Uh, thank you for your introduction and great to have the honor to be uh, the awardee of the Schwab Foundation and the World Economic Forum. So it's a really great honor. And congratulations to other awardees. So, uh, I guess actually now we are calling ourselves as a catalyst and a wave maker and ecosystem builder for the social innovation society in China for an inclusive society but actually it takes a long time for us to recognize that so about 18 years ago when i sold out my dot-com company start to thinking about how to get uh, into the social development sector uh, all in our mind is how to leverage market power to help the poor so we become uh, serial social entrepreneurs and uh, venture creators. So we set up uh, about six uh, social enterprise and big ups in China, uh, like you know, microfinance one, early education one, uh, vocational training and job creation one for the rural migrants, and even for affordable housing. With that direct service, we almost served a million people here in China for the past 15 more years. And about 10 years ago, we are thinking how to uh, leverage our potential uh, for more impact for jobs. So oh, we think maybe we have the expertise uh, to partner with great partners. We try to really make a, a new system uh, in China for the social innovators, a new ecosystem. Because in China, I think one, one special thing is actually business sector is the foundation of the civil society, which is quite different from the others. So how to leverage the business power, how to leverage the tech power for good is uh, really a main challenge for us and uh, with that i think we actually find uh, an, another position is quite suitable for us is help the social innovators from their 
minus one to 0 0.5 uh, stage. I mean, when people cannot judge how risk it takes, we can help them in that stage. It really makes uh, a lot of new things can be happen. My daughter are very happy recently because she just joined a, a new type high school, a high school raised by a high school graduate. So the principal of the high school is just now uh, 23 years old. His name is Jason Wang. So Jason actually set up this uh, new type high school, a creative high school about three years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, I think he is, uh, uh, he's he was 20. So he gave up the opportunity to, uh, to be a college student in the United States about uh, four years ago. He decided to, to use his expertise with his, uh, his roommates in China to, uh, to found a new type of school because I think he understand that the over challenge for for lots of people like him and my daughter age is they spend they waste a lot of time in the classroom to do lots of uh, exercise for a high school and that is not actually people needed for the future so they decide to ch change the situation by themselves. And actually, they got some systemic help. Jason got a lot of people to help from uh, traditional educators, from uh, new type investors. So actually, they didn't do this high school as a nonprofit first. They they do the high school as a B corp. With that, I think Jason understand how to leverage entrepreneurship and the volunteerism together. Thank you, Jaffin. Uh, not only have you proven with your life's work that you believe in this approach, that the bottom-up approach of seeing solutions develop and see what works, but clearly you're putting your daughter in the school as well, and so you uh, uh, fully believe in this approach. It's clear that next generation will also lead us, and I think this is the work of, of Lindiwe as well, is to, is to empower them. And yet right now it remains a crisis. Uh, South Africa has had an extremely hard lockdown, Lindy. And tell us a bit about the reality and the challenge that you face. Despite reaching 500,000 uh, school children, um, what else, what do governments need to do to enable the work of social entrepreneurs and social innovators? Yeah, I mean, um, with us, the 500,000, for, for me, I see it as a failure, really, because we have 11 million kids um, in South Africa that are at, at, at school. And 500,000 is literally just a drop in the ocean. And the reason for that is because of lack of access to internet and lack of, um, you know, and also the price of, of, um, of data in South Africa being one of the highest in the world. So, um, and currently now, I, I, I see that even before, I mean, COVID, that access to internet was not something that is, was seen as, um, you know, a basic need, some, something that government should actually invest. Because if you look at how much money has been invested in the development of broadband, it's not a lot. And, and obviously, um, being a developing country, obviously, you know, the issue was we need to focus on issues of, of bread and butter. We must build schools. We must, must make sure that people um, have access like, um, to social security. While those are important, but this, um, this crisis showed us that access to internet is actually just as important because all the kids of um, the, the parents who are relatively well off, the middle class and rich, were not affected at all by... Um, by COVID-19, my kids have been going to school the entire time. So they went through the entire curriculum. I was listening to our minister um, last week, a few weeks ago, actually talking about how it's going to take about between 18 and two years for the kids who were not, who, who basically during hard lockdown were not able to go to school for them to recover. And that also, what it does, it also increases the achievement gap. Because what it means is that those kids from rich families or middle class family are, are going to just, I mean, cruise through and they're going to pass, they're going to do well at universities. But the kids that are poor um, are going to struggle 
And that's not because they are not smart. It's just a matter of, you know, where they are, they are born, who their parents are matters. And I've seen also, when you, you look at governments, you find that, for, I'm just going to make an example with South Africa. You see our government has, um, you know, um, a, a, a team of um, leading CEOs and entrepreneurs that advises them on investment. But you look at even a lot of countries, you won't see um, a government or president having a team of social entrepreneurs advising him as well. While we need business, um, for the economy to grow, but you also need social entrepreneurs who are able to balance both um, the social issues as well as, as entrepreneurship. While um, a business will measure their success just on profit alone, a social entrepreneurs m measure our success based on impact. It's not so much about how much money I've made, it's also how, much, how many people did I help while making the money that I made. Right, so it's it's really important that those social entrepreneurs should also be um, uh, have a seat at the table so that they can help in in influencing policy and also uh, also one thing that I love about um, about social entrepreneurs when we start we don't have money so you start from nothing so we know how we can actually go out and and inspire other other young people to be able to get into this sector because we know how to do more with little. So, and that goes a long way because by the time you have more resources, you're able to reach more because you used to be frugal. You used to, to focus on, you know, the one dollar must go as further as possible. Now, when I have one million, instead of just focusing on the PR, I'm like, I don't need PR. I can reach one million kids, you know? So I think that is really something that is really important because if you look at how um, social, it, some companies, when they in, invest in, um, you know, in their social um, responsibility, it's always mo mostly about the PR. You find that they spend more money on the PR than they do on the actual programs. Um, so I think it's, it's, we social innovators should be given a seat at the table. Thank you, Lindy, for showing us the values at the heart of social innovators. You really embody that uh, in all that you do. And just thank you again for, for your work. Uh, Karine, uh, as we come to the close here, it's clear that the year ahead is going to be a difficult economy for all organizations, both for-profit companies and non-profits. How do you continue to sustain your work uh, and continue to convince uh, a large corporation that this work is important uh, now more than ever. You're right. It's going to be a challenge. Uh, and I think it's also going to be an opportunity because I think that now it's clear for everybody, for um, individual consumers, people, that things are uh, interconnected. Congratulations again. And to all of the awardees, a warm welcome to the Schwab Foundation community, an incredible community that makes us each day get up, and despite what we read in the papers, we know there is an incredible hope for the world. You represent tens of thousands of social innovators around the world who look up to you. We salute you, we honor you, we celebrate you, and we thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. I really hope to meet you all in person next year. And finally, I'm thrilled to introduce to you now a celebrated musician and dear friend who spontaneously agreed to conclude our celebration with short remarks and a piece of music. The world-famous cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Thank you, Hildy. I am so excited to be here today welcoming the Social Innovators of the Year 2020. The Schwab Foundation and Hildy have been unwavering in their support of this community because you are so important to the world. And let me tell you something that I think that you have done. You have improved the lives of people around you in the world because you care. And I think that's one of the most important things to start with and to end with. You care. You care because when people hurt are hurt, you hurt. You care because you have been able to listen to what the needs are of people. You care, therefore, about the environment. 
about the sustainability of the environment, about how we consume. You care about people's health, people's education. You care about rural development and job training. You want people to find jobs. And you care about human rights and equality in places all around the world. So I am so excited that you are adding to what is going to be an improved state of the world, which is the mission of the World Economic Forum. And in order to thank you, I would like uh, to play for you two little pieces of music. One is called Simple Gifts. And the second one actually has everything to do with listening, because the composer of that work did very much like what you did, is you listened. And that's how he taught his students. He taught his students, he said to them, don't compose like me, but just listen. Listen to the music around you. Listen to what people are saying through their music, whether it's the indigenous Americans or to African Americans or immigrants all around you. And his students, guess what? They listened and then they became teachers. And when they became teachers, they taught their students to listen. And it took two generations of people listening that created the unique voices, innovative voices of Aaron Copeland, Duke Ellington, and George Gershwin. So the composer, the teacher is Dvorak, it's coming home. But we're starting with a thank you of simple gifts and then coming home as gratitude for everything that you have accomplished and are going to accomplish. Thank you. 